without a preacher. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How can they go unless they're sent? And, and God has this group of disciples, this group of apostles in Jerusalem, and they're preaching and teaching, and a lot of the Jewish uh, rejection is around them, and things are going, and what does God do but disperse these people all over the land? And the church starts to grow outside the walls of Jerusalem. That was his, his intent. The whole world would hear about Jesus. God has a perfect plan, and he'll go to any length to get it done. But whosoever would believe shall be saved, and that was his purpose. God uses the most unlikely for his work. I never thought I'd be standing up here. And I'm telling you what, if he'd save Mikey, he'll save any one of you. Because you don't come close. But God uses the most unlikely for his work. Saul appears on the road to Damascus. Saul is the one that we better know now as Paul. And we'll get into that here uh, down in the next couple weeks here. But Saul appears on the road to Damascus. And this bright light comes over him. And says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And knocks him to the ground, blinder and back. And when he gets up, he can't see. And God has the perfect plan. He's already called Saul to minister to the Gentiles. And he don't have a clue what just happened to him. All he knows, he's blind. When you persecute a fellow believer, you persecute Jesus. And I want that lesson to come out of this for you and me right now. It is so easy for us to persecute a, a fellow believer. Things are not always as they appear, as they seem, but boy, do we have an opinion. And Jesus says, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul was persecuting fellow believers, Christians, but Jesus took it on himself. Brothers and sisters, help me not to persecute our own, our family. We have to be careful. It's so easy to do, to have a judgmental spirit. He blinds Saul, heals him, and chooses him as an instrument to carry the name of Jesus to the Gentiles. He got up and was baptized. Cool. Part of the family. And God allows him to spend some time with the disciples. I think that's cool. It is so cool to spend time with our own. It is so needed. I don't know about you all, but I need you to spend time with me because you encourage me. You pray for me. You help me accomplish the work that God's called us to do. And it's necessary. I want us to read our text this morning, and it's in Acts 9, and it's verses 19 through 31. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among, among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates 
in order to kill him. I want to stop there just for a second and tell us that at that time there wasn't a calendar as you and I know it. Time was called days. There's almost three years passed in those days. It's amazing. Study that out. Three years he was dodging these guys trying to kill him. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Right there is the theme for our, our message today. There is a hole in your wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. The Word of God. Awesome. Scripture that shows us that if we step out and serve God, he has his hand of favor over us. He has the perfect plan. I want us to think about us having holes in our walls as we talk about this today. i got ten points to make uh, from this scripture. The first thing is God can and will use us at once. How many people in this room have said, God can't use me? Yeah, their hands are going up everywhere. How many wish he wasn't using you? <laughs> you know what? I have so many people come to me and say, Pastor Mike, will you pray for me? Will you do this? Will you do that? When they have the ability, the authority to do it on their own. Here's a guy that is killing, wanting to kill Christians and locking them in jail and persecuting them. And God uses him in a mighty way. It says that once he began to preach. Jesus didn't say time out. Uh, you pick a seminary out. Uh, you might want to go to Grace or, or somewhere and, and learn about Scripture and theology. No, he knocked him down, blinded him, and when he came to, he was filled with the Spirit and was able to preach instantly to people. Not all of us are preachers, but all of us are witnesses. I want us to get that straight in our minds. Not all of us in this room are called to be preachers. But I want to tell you something. If God has saved you, turned you right side up, you have a witness. And he expects you to use that witness. And you can do it instantly. You know how God has changed you, protected you, and loved you. And you have a testimony. A witness. And there are people all around us that need to hear that and know that. It's your story, and no one can doubt it, because it happened to you. There's a preparation time for ministry, but not for witnessing. We as leaders, those of us that do ministry full force, there is a preparation time. And Pat, I think, has got Ephesians 4 up there, 11 through 15. Some of us have gifts, but all of us have a witness. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. 
until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Some of us got to grow up, guys and gals, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. That's our purpose. So some of us have gifting to be able to bring people to that place. And I know there are some people in here that get discontented with me once in a while for preaching a simple message all the time. But we've got a lot of baby Christians, a lot of people that have come from other faiths and denominations, and they're struggling with the law and legalism that man placed on them. And when God gave me a calling to start destiny, it was my heart that, that heard from him say, if you got to look it up, don't use it. If I have to look a word up in the dictionary to know what it means, I'm not going to tell it. I'm not going to use it. I use ain't a whole lot in my description. People need to hear simple. People need to have repetition for it to sink deep into their hearts and their minds. Can anybody agree with me? Each of us are workers for the harvest field. We may not be called, maybe, but we're responsible to do it. We all have a witness for Jesus. The second point I want to make is people remember our past. Can anybody say amen to that? Our mind stores images up all the time. There are things that flash back in our minds from long ago. People that have Alzheimer's and everything can remember things that happened 70 years ago and they can't remember what they had for lunch 15 minutes ago. Images come back to us constantly. We remember way too much from the past. Way too much. There are people that need to be set free from their past. They're holding on to that. It's a yoke. It's a bondage. But people remember our past. It sets up a judgmental spirit. There's bitterness and unforgiveness that sets in when we hold on to our past. And we have to release it because that hinders our prayer life. It holds us back from the fullness. God came, Jesus came for abundant life. Not just to, to survive, but to thrive, that song says. There's so much more for us. We have to let go of a judgmental spirit, bitterness and unforgiveness. And oh my gosh, is that hard. John 1, 46, they said about Jesus, can anything good come from there? Come and see, said Philip. We all need Philips in our backcourt, all of us. We need an encourager. In our story today, Barnabas steps up for Saul. Can anything come good come out of Nazareth, they said about Jesus. I went uh, to our local barber across the street over here. Uh, Carl Wagner and I graduated together umpteen million years ago. And that guy's been cutting hair over there. I think he told me for, it's like 45 years, 43 or 45 years he told me every day. But he filled me in on all the gossip that Destiny's created. I kind of sort of went over there for that. Because Carrie, my daughter Carrie cuts my hair. And I thought, I'm just going to, I got a man and I'm going over to see what Carl's got to say. And man, did he fill me in. He knows how many times the guys have been on the roof to fix a spot back there that wouldn't quit leaking. He knows everything about what we've done. And then he filled me in all the gossip that I've generated. 
guy said, who's pastor over there? He said, Mike Allball. And they said, not the Mike Allball I know. <laughs> and I looked at Carl and I said, Carl, you're right. It's not the Mike Allball that you knew or they knew. God is a God that changes people. But you know what? They've got those old memories of me. And half of them they mixed up with my brother. But that's a <laughs> But he filled me in on all the gossip. People gossip. People remember our past. And sometimes they can't get past our past to see what we're doing now. Don't have a judgmental spirit like that, guys and gals. God is in the is in the changing business. People change. Do we have to kind of sort of be careful and, and, and watch what we do, how much we trust them? Sure we do. There were several people got hurt over that guy and gal from Oklahoma that came in here and got the food and got the job. But you know what? We're going to get a blessing for that. And there will be a day, there will be a day that Frank and his girlfriend bow before the Lord and answer, do you remember when? We can't get in that judgmental spirit business. It's not ours to get into. But we do have to set people free in Jesus. It wasn't the same Saul that everyone knew as well in our story. He had changed. God changes people, and not all of us get changed instantly or suddenly like he did. For some of us, it's a progression. And then that discourages us because they see Saul over here suddenly, instantly change. And why can't I be? And it's probably because there's some things in this heart that need to be circumcised and cut away and changed slowly but surely. So don't ever compare yourself to anybody else in the ministry. Oh God, do I wish I could pray and, and preach and teach like a lot of our speakers we had last week. But you know what? God didn't call me to be them. He called me to be who I am. And I'm right here doing all I know to do. Verse 22, it says, Yet Saul grew more and more powerful. If we take one step at a time, the more God uses us, the more we see his hand and strength on us and the more powerful we become and the more we are able to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ and be life changers. It says he grew. It is an instant. Sanctification is a progress. It's a slow grade uphill and we never achieve it until Jesus calls us out of here. And then we are made perfect. Until then, I'm sorry. You ain't any more perfect than I am. None. None of us are where we need to be, but thank God we're not where we used to be. Amen. I have seen so much change in you all since you've come here. It just blows me away. I was in here the other morning in Eli. Uh, I can't wait till we have building dedication. You get to meet Eli. He's, he was kind of, sort of, the, turned into the general contractor of this, this building. Uh, he's a Mexican, uh, second, third generation. Mex he, 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 he'll, you can call him anything and he answers. But he came in the door the other morning and he locked eyes with me. I just had made a pot of coffee and I, I was drinking a cup of coffee. And I could see something was wrong with him. I said, Eli, you okay? No, I'm not okay. I said, what's the matter? I thought maybe he hit a deer with his brand new van or something. This place has got a hold of me. He said, it's got a fire in me. And I said, Eli, was you reading our, our stuff on the stage from last week? No. I said, well, that was our theme for the whole week, light a fire in me. 
Man, it happened. He said, it's taken all the way from this building to Butler. He said, I can't believe it. He said, God has got to hold me and he won't let go. And he said, my wife told me before I left this morning, shut up and do something about it. Then. <laughs> and he was bawling, just leaving. That's what it's about. Wasn't even intentional. It happened. God is contagious. I can't wait till you meet him. He's this guy's son. But he got any done with him yet. He, he's got workers that are drunks. And they don't show up to work all the time. They can't pay their rent because they're drinking it up. They're just doing all kinds of stuff. And he stopped and, and saw this guy on the way to work. His, uh, his buddy, he took over his checkbook and everything about him. He pays his rent. He does everything for him. He's got him off of booze for a year and a half. He's been sober. He's paid his bills. He's got a savings account. And he's got four rental houses. And two of them are for sale. And he says, how about we buy those two you got for sale and turn them into ministry houses? He said, that's funny. God's been speaking to me about the same thing. So on the way over here, he, he's, he's already got this plan to do ministry. And he said, Mike, it's because destiny had me come here and remodel this building. And I caught the fire. And I'm taking it back to Butler. He goes to Arizona and works in the wintertime. And, and he's gone just before Christmas. And he said, when you all have your building dedication, I am flying back here for it. He's, that, 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 he's just on fire. So we never know how we're going to touch people. And what I want to say, yet Saul grew more and more and more powerful. They also watched and waited on him to mess up. The apostles did not trust that rascal whatsoever. And it took Barnabas, somebody that had time to sit back and watch Saul and say, this dude's for real. To listen to him and know he was spirit-filled, to know he had changed, to know that he was reliable, and could be used in ministry. And he scooped him up and took him to the apostles and introduced him and said, this guy's real. Brothers and sisters, there are people all around you that need to know that you know they're real. And a lot of them are young kids. They're on fire for God. And they need a chance to prove it. Don't ever pass up a time to mentor somebody. To grow them. That's Roger's heartbeat with Powerhouse. Is to mentor these young people. And turn them in to precious young citizens in our city. And have them be on fire for Jesus. But what I said all that to say. Don't mess up with your witness and your testimony. People remember your past and they're sitting on their duff watching you and waiting on you just to mess up so they can say, see, I told you so. And it's not easy. There are times people trip our triggers and we want to knock them out. But we can't. We have to have a compassionate heart like Jesus does. Oh my gosh. I'm only on my third point. Our purpose <laughs> is to do things in the name of Jesus. We have to do things in the name of Jesus. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of thee. We've got to do it in Jesus' name. Every other name doesn't count. And there are so many different names out there. There are Methodists, Catholics, Lutherans, non-denominationals. If it ain't in Jesus' name, it don't matter what it is. 
And I don't know how many churches I've seen in the last 15 years change their name and change nothing else and expected the ministry to flourish just because they changed their name. It's in the name of Jesus that we have to do things. Way too many people want to kill the work of Jesus. I want to tell you something. There are wolves among the sheep. There are wolves in this congregation right now. Wanting to kill the work. Instead of praying and blessing and supporting, they want to tear it down and say it will never work. It can't work. And I had some wolves really nail me when I shared my vision about planting destiny family of faith. Uh, dude, you're up against a brick wall because three people have already tried to plant a new church in Cannabell and they all failed. And I said, well, God's got a serious, serious problem there because he just called me to do it. There are people that want to kill the work of Jesus. Revenge comes from an unsaved heart. These Jews, these, these people around listening were unsaved people and they wanted to kill Saul. They wanted to kill Peter and John. Romans 12, 19. If you never pick up a scripture in the Bible, take this to heart. Read it over and over. Get it in your heart. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written... It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Now here, Pat, it, it, do you, it, you don't have the next one? I, I, it's probably 20, isn't it? Treat evil with good. It says treat evil with good. Oh, is that hard. People don't deserve good when they're nasty to me. You know what? If we got the heart of Jesus, we have to do that. It isn't up to us. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Treat evil with good, he says. That is your job and my job. To treat evil with good. And that isn't easy. People want to take Saul out. After many days had gone by, uh, which I already told you is close to three years, those many days, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So many things need to be done for Jesus, but a threat is always present. But it says, Saul preached fearlessly. And I need you all to help me preach fearlessly. We've got a mess going on right now with some gay right movements and stuff. And I'm telling you, we're going to find out what's going to happen in our churches in America really quick. But I'm here to tell you, I ain't bowing to nothing. You might have to be praying for me. You might have to come over to Alvin and see me. But I'm going to be witnessing over there. And there's going to be Mark and, and Roger, the different people in here. There are all kinds of people in here that step up and preach the truth. And they will, just like I'm going to. We're not bowing to the mess. Any different than these guys did. Fifth point, God has a hedge of protection on his call. There's a hedge of protection on us. He provided people in, in Saul's path to keep him safe while he preached the word. The followers took care of Saul. And here's my point. There's a hole in the wall for your escape. There are so many of us in this room right now that are in bondage. They think we're boxed in. And there's no way out. The walls are too high. But I want to tell you what. God has a hole in the wall. There's a way for you to get out. He never puts you in a place that you can't get out of. And if you're in bondage, if something has a hold, a hold of your life, you need to be looking for the hole in the wall. Because there is a hole that will cause you to flourish 
and be able to be viable for Jesus Christ. And the first thing we do is try to patch our little hole in the wall. And when we patch that hole that God created in our wall, no one can get in and nobody can get out. And we've done that in our churches. We've sealed the doors of our churches off. And there's, that's the hole for people to come in here and get healed and get ministered to. It's a bigger hole for you and I to go out of and reach a community that's broken. Every one of us have a hole in the wall. Some of us have bigger ones. Some of us have smaller ones. But there's a hole. There's an escape that God has prepared for you. When things seem impossible, God has an opening for your escape. Hang on to that. That's six. I've got ten. Can't go there. Barnabas introduces Saul to the apostle. Gets him away. To be trusted. And to be able to be looked after while he shares the gospel. If you know someone that's good for ministry, be a Barnabas and introduce them. And then I wrote, better yet, mentor someone to be that person. Raise them up to your level. You may think you're not high enough to cause anybody to be a leader or to be responsible with God's work, but that's wrong. You can take anybody to your level. And it's my job to mentor you and get you higher so you can continue to get others higher. Never be afraid to lift somebody up to the point you're at because God has appointed your place and time for such a time as this. Turmoil upsets the church. There was turmoil going all, all over the place and the guys saw that they had to get Saul out of there and they sent him to Tarsus. And I'm thinking, Lord, don't take me away from Kinderville. I want to stay right here. But you know what? I may end up in Alabama jail, for all I know, for preaching the truth. He may need to take me to Alabama so there will be peace here in Kinderville. And I think that's one of the biggest problems we have in our church today. And I'm talking about the church universal. Is people have gotten too comfortable they know where they can back off and stay comfortable and not get any resistance. And that's where they've settled into. And people are down here and they're stuck in milk and they never are being trained up to get on that meat that, meat that we so desperately all need. God help us at Destiny Family of Faith to never get lukewarm and settle for where it's comfortable. Jesus promised us that we would go through a mess. He didn't say if, he said when. But he'll never call any of us in this room to something that he won't get us through. Are we in it together? Can we do it? Somebody yelled, the horses are loose. Let's get it coming. Pulling in the parking lot this morning. I said, dude, the horses are loose out there. <laughs> so the guys, that we yell at them, they all run out there. And there's, a, I don't know, is there 150 head out there? Or how many <coughs> you tied that little hitching round? Four. Four? Well, it's about three too many because they yanked that baby down and snapped that horse right off. <laughs> They're all just staying out there eating grass. <laughs> <laughs> the only church in Cannibal had somebody ride horses. Joe Pranger used to tell me if it takes a candy bar, buy a whole box full. We have to do what it takes to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. Whether it's a hitch rail outside in the grass, it's a bus to pick kids up, whatever it might be, we are responsible to do that. I wrote up here... No God, no peace.
Those guys that were accusing Saul didn't know God. And I'm telling you what, brothers and sisters, there are tons of people around us in this city and surrounding idea, uh, areas here around Kinderville that don't know God. And it's our job, our purpose to do that. If we know God, have a relationship with Him, then we know peace. And they had to take Saul out of the city there at Jerusalem and around and move him to Tarsus. And you know what? Tarsus got blessed with the truth. So God's plan and purpose is so much bigger than all of us. And his plan and purpose was Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we're going to take communion right now. And here at Destiny, we serve an open communion. And that means that if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we want you to commune with us. We hold the elements and we'll all take them together. Bear with us. This will be our first time in here is taking communion, so we'll have to get, get the plan a little bit. There was a time of peace that comes to the church. Peace causes growth. I want us to know that, that the peace of the church causes growth. I've seen so many people grow this last week through wisdom meets passion. There was a peace in here. There was a place that destiny has generated here where people can come and be at peace and know they can drop their guard and learn and grow in Jesus. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. When peace comes, it causes focus. We're not distracted by a mess. There are so many distractions in our lives every day that cause us to forget and not to focus, to lose focus on Jesus and who he is and why he came. Peace brings encouragement. When there's a peaceful time, we know that the hope we have in Christ Jesus is real. There's a peace in this room right now that passes all understanding. There's no turmoil in here. No, no harmful threats, things that want to take us out. Peace brings encouragement. Peace brings strength. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst of thee. And the only true peace we have is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. There's strength in this room. When we unite together in prayer, when we're of one heart and one mind, it is impossible for Satan to take us over. We always have to be focused on God's will, His plans and purposes, not ours. Peace brings church growth. People are seeking out the peace of God, and when they find it, it they sink in and grab a hold of that and the church continues to grow just like it did in, the, in the, the book Acts. 33 AD, the church started, and now it's 2014, and it still grows because of the name of Jesus. But brothers and sisters, I want us to always remember that peace can also cause us to get fat and lazy. When there's no obstruction, when things get to going good, it's easy to settle down and lean back and take in a deep breath and sit there and get fat and lazy. Unusable for Jesus Christ and His glory and His honor. We get to glorify in ourselves more than we glorify Him. And then there's a problem. 
God help us to never get to that place. Jesus Christ died for you and me, was nailed to that cross for our salvation, our forgiveness. It didn't cost you and me anything, but boy, did it cost him. And we never can set back and get fat and lazy and be lazy about what he's called us to do. The work of Jesus Christ will always go on. There will always need to be someone sent to preach. Someone sent to be a servant for Jesus. This body and blood you hold in your hand came with a high price. It wasn't even his fault. He was perfect, sinless. But he chose to take on your sin and mine. And he said, Father, if there's any possible way you can take this cup from me, take it from me. And people say, Jesus didn't want to do that. You know what he didn't want? He didn't want the Father to turn his back on him because God cannot look at sin. And when Jesus took your sin and mine on, it got dark. It got black out. And Jesus didn't want that to happen. The Father and I are one, he told us so many times. And he knew when he took your sin and mine on, the Father could not look at him because he was unrighteous, unholy. But boy, did he pay the price. A Jesus that loved you and me so much that he went to the cross. John 6, 35 says, I am the bread of life who comes to me will never go hungry. There's a spiritual hungriness, if that's a word, in everybody that God created and it can only be filled by Jesus. He is the bread of life. You and I eat and we're hungry again. This little Afghani girl I got down here that's with Karen and I eat us out of house and home. <laughs> Jesus said, you eat of the bread that I have and you'll never hunger again. There'll be a spiritual fulfillment when we get to heaven where we won't lack anymore. And I know we're going to eat like we ain't never eat before when we get there because he's got a banquet table prepared for us. But until we get to that place, he used his body for full atonement for your sin and mine. It was nailed to that cross and every time a spike was put in him, he yelled, it hurts so bad. I thank God that he loved me enough to send Jesus to take my place. Let's take the body of Christ. The blood of Jesus that we hold in our hands. That scripture, John goes on to say, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And I ask you this morning, do you fully believe in Jesus this morning? He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Water, it's a temporary relief of thirst, temporary the fluid that was spilled for you and me, the blood of Jesus, completely covered our sin. And brothers and sisters, to whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He has forgiven your sin as far as the east is from the west, never to bring it up again, never to bring it up again. Jesus' blood washed us whiter than snow. 
We're spotless. We are the bride of Christ sitting here this morning, and he looks at us as spotless. And he can do that now because he allowed the Father to reject him. I think scripture says for almost three hours it was dark, and God could not look on that. But boy, does he see us now. There's a Jesus that sat at the right hand of God the Father, and you and I are on the other side of him. And when God looks through Jesus, he sees you and I holy, righteous, and upright. And it's all because of the blood of Jesus Christ. What can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's partake the blood of Jesus. Lord Jesus, we love you more than you will ever, ever, ever know. Without you, we were nothing. And Lord, help us. There are people that see our past, they know our past, and they're judgmental toward us. But Lord Jesus, I'm asking you right now that every person in this room could be in you so deep that they don't care how anybody looks at, your, at their past because you see them now as righteous and holy and upright. Lord, we don't know what's ahead. We don't know what tomorrow brings, but for us today, we're going to stand firm. We're going to hold fast to your word and we're going to do the best we know how to fearlessly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in Kenneville, Indiana, in Indianapolis, in Washington, in Dominican, in Africa, wherever you might move us from and to, we'll proclaim the word of Jesus and do it the best we know how. Lord, I pray a blessing over every person in this room right now, whether their family hurts, as we saw in the video this morning, whether their marriage might be a little rocky, whether we may have a nasty little friend at school that is picking on us and misusing us, or we've got this, this rascal at work that just won't leave us alone. Lord, I pray that you would use them fearlessly and boldly to set the example of Jesus Christ no matter where they go. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We lift you up. We glorify you because you alone are worthy. And we thank you for your foresight, your predestination, your predetermination to have Jesus Christ come as our Lord and Savior. And Lord, we truly will remember what he's done for us until he returns. And we can do that because he's given us the Lord's Supper to remember as often as we do it until he returns. Lord, we look forward to that day. What a glorious day it'll be when the trumpet sounds and Jesus returns to take us home. And then, and only then, will we be able to experience perfection. No sickness, no sadness, no sorrow. And it's in Jesus' name we preach and pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go with God, he loves you.